Choose though. Always prepared and talk at length. Two separate things. <laughs> Oh, I'm popping off of here. Carmina, let me know via chat if you need me. Um, stay right there. Okay. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I am pleased um, to highlight the best of Harrisburg in terms of the best caucus out there. I am just going to do a brief introduction of the chair, and then we're going to roll into the conversation. Um, what else can I say about uh, Chair Bullock except that I am one of her number one fans? I was just telling someone today that even after all this time, you know, she still gets the work in, she still grinds, and she still um, gets her own petition signed herself. And I think that when you look at that type of leadership, she exemplifies what it means to be a leader and bringing everyone else under her. I happen to live in her district and everyone in my building is just, we're infatuated. We just love her. So I think that she's like the best person to really highlight what is going on in the Black Caucus, what the outlook is uh, for the caucus. And that's why we're here tonight. And the topic of discussion is legislating for Black Pennsylvanians. And without further ado, I'd just like to introduce the chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, Donna Bullock. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Carmina, for that introduction. And as I um, begin my remarks, I note that two of my colleagues have entered. I'm not sure if we can get them into the uh, panel section. And then Rep. Parker and Rep. Curry, um, I see them in the chat. So um, thank you very much. So I am so excited to talk about the Black Caucus and uh, my role here as the chair of the Black Caucus and and what we have been doing. And I think to get started for me, I wanted to share a video that we put together last year um, that really um, kind of just illustrates our history and, the, and why we are here um, and some of the details of the Black Caucus. So I'm gonna share that video and, and get us started here. Is it going uh, in? No, that's, that's not what I want. Hold on. <laughs> okay, as I try to figure that out. Okay, is that showing for you guys there? Yeah. Okay. So um, the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus was founded in 1973. And really to just help us, um, uh, it was founded by a group of members, including K Kay Leroy Irvis and a number of other members um, to meet. And when they were meeting at first, they were meeting in private uh, and trying to figure out how to be a voice for black legislators and the people that they serve in their community. Oh, this is, I'm really having some issues here, okay. So it looks like the video is not working. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my slides at this point um, and just move on with my presentation. I apologize for that. Um, but you know, we, we were formed in many ways to be that voice for our black legislators and to help us represent the communities across the Commonwealth. And what I would tell you is that um, in recent years, we have become more and more diverse. We have become more regionally diverse. We're not just the Philadelphia contingency or the Pittsburgh de delegation. We have black folks 
throughout the Commonwealth. And we have been able to not just elect folks in those spaces, but also reach out to those communities and say, your voices are important in Harrisburg because the issues that we talk about in Harrisburg impact Black folks all across the Commonwealth. And so uh, one of the other issues that I know my colleagues have been very diligent about saying is that we're not a, a monolithic issue organization, right? We're not just about criminal justice reform. We also address issues like environmental justice and equity. We, we also are concerned about health care and health equity. We're education. Um, from everything that you may possibly think of, our, our, our participation in the cannabis industry. Um, and so my colleagues and I have look, really looked to cast a wide net and, and look at all of the intersectionalities in which Black folks can have an impact on legislation and policy. And in many ways, what we know is that if we look at how we address legislation and policy from our perspective, from our experiences and from the lenses that we bring to the Commonwealth, and we're able to address the issues that impact the Black mother or a Black child that goes to a school in Reading or in Philadelphia or a Black small business owner in Erie or in Pittsburgh, that we're able to address those issues. We can not just help that particular community or that particular constituent, but we create a better Commonwealth for all Pennsylvanians. Um, I often lean on the you know, Black woman best economic policy that has been promoted by an economist that works in the Biden administration. That says if we do the work to make sure that Black women are doing their best, then all would do better, right? If we make sure we address student loan debt for Black women, the minimum wage for Black women, education for Black women, all of those things, because Black women tend to be, um, unfortunately, at the the, the lower um and to tend to be more impacted by all of those issues, where we're able to make her life better, improve her quality of life, we improve the quality of life of all folks. And Absolutely. so it's been an honor for me to chair the Black Caucus in the last two years during a time, during a COVID-19, during a pandemic, during um, you know a time when racial injustice and equity has been highlighted and uh, really you know under a microscope in this country and understanding the the burden that I have, an obligation I have to, to elevate and amplify the voices of my colleagues and to give them the space to lead. And so it's been an honor to do that. And that's why I've, I've been looking at creating spaces in which each of my colleagues can lead, because I don't know the answers to all these things and they're not all my issues. But I know that I have colleagues within the Black Caucus who are passionate about healthcare or passionate about small businesses, passionate about criminal justice reform. And those are spaces where each and every one of them are very much capable of leading. And so tonight I wanted to bring some of those leaders to the table to share uh, with us the work that they've been doing, their experiences um, in the Capitol. And what I would tell you before I pass it on to them is that being a black legislator in Harrisburg has its challenges. And being a black woman in that space even adds to those challenges. And it's something I've always talked about from the moment I got elected, there had only been nine black women in the whole 253 legislators. And while the numbers have changed as far as who comes and who goes, we have remained at the number nine. And that had really shaped the kind of experience that I've had. And, and the, the running sort of number there was that there were nine black women at one point and 13 white guys named Mike. Now I'll tell you this year, we outnumber the white guys named Mike. So it, it is progress in that sense. There has been progress in that we have been able to find some spaces in which black women are leading. And not only are we, I mean, we may only still be nine, but we are leading. We have leader Joanna McClinton, the first black woman to lead one of our parties on the house floor. We have myself chairing the Black Caucus. We have Morgan Cephas chairing the Women's Health Caucus. So Black women are leading within the House. And I think that is going, that is a, uh, a prediction of where we are going here. But not only are the Black women leading, we have Black men in leadership. Jordan Harris is the whip. Senator uh, Hughes is the appropriations chair in the Senate. And Senator Williams is the whip in the Senate. So again, we are showing that while we may be small in number, we are leading in the House and I think in the Senate. And I think that that is going to uh, be transformative in the way that we see policy and legislation move forward within 
the General Assembly. So that being said, I'm going to um, pass the mic on to one of my colleagues. We're going to shift a little bit from our previously agreed agenda, and we're going to start with Rep. Nelson, and then uh, Rep. Curry will follow. I appreciate it, and I'm, I'm thrilled that I get to go before uh, Rep. Rab because uh, he'll make sure that he corrects all the stuff I say and, and give everybody the appropriate amens. It is an absolute pleasure to uh, be here and a pleasure to join you all. Um, this is just a great time and, and thrilled that so many folks would come out and talk about uh, not only what's important within the Keystone State, but to, to join our session and, and talk and, and digest what's important to uh, Black Pennsylvania and BIPOC communities throughout Pennsylvania on a Friday evening. Um, is phenomenal coming out of the the rains that we've had. This is great. And this is the sort of engagement that we need, not only in this critical time for Pennsylvania, um, and I'm not even going to talk anything about election season, but, but it is a critical, critical time. Uh, education and the state of education and education funding is uh, not only kind of the topic du jour on the floor in the House and in the Senate, uh, and certainly out of the governor's mouth, but it is also front and center in, in our court system, as well as obviously we're, we're all seeing and feeling what that looks like in our communities. Uh, you know, we're all looking forward to Philadelphia's, uh, you know, hoping and praying that our, our next superintendent is able to continue to build. Uh, and we're certainly hoping that we do so with an eye towards our instructors, our teachers, uh, ensuring that we've got a viable pipeline uh, for that next generation. I always argue as much as, and we will talk a little bit also about the importance of um, just kind of criminal justice. And I know there was a criminal justice um, panel just before this. It's crucial that we understand how many lives are, unfortunately, I hate to say almost thrown away at the hands of just kind of a poor and failing education system far earlier than they're thrown away at the hands of, of um, police brutality and police violence, or even, uh, you know, community violence. We're losing our young men and women um, through uh, our school system and our underfunded school systems far earlier and more frequently than we do anything else. And I think it's also important that we appreciate, um, and one of the things that Rep. Cephas really brings about, and one of the areas that we talked an awful lot about within the Legislative Black Caucus's budget equity um, kind of framework is that all of our community relies on really just kind of these social determinants of health, right? We need to ensure we have a, a viable um, criminal justice system. And we need to make sure that we have a really strong education system. Certainly through the pandemic, we've seen how important that healthcare system is. Uh, and we also though know that you need to, and we need to continually invest in just wealth, black wealth. And I don't mean, you know, we need more, you know, minted, you know, millionaires and billionaires, but we need more uh, higher uh, numbers of home ownership. Uh, we need to in, uh, make sure that we're investing in uh, black businesses, that we're investing in affordable housing, which will be a key focus for us throughout the budget cycle. Um, and all of those four kind of, you know, major, you know, legs of this thing, they all work in conjunction. They all, you know, work um, alongside each other. You can't really think that pushing on one lever is going to solve the ills and we'll get back to the others, you know, two or three years from now. Because if you only invest in small businesses, but never uh, appreciably invest in our healthcare system or never ensure that we're providing quality education, the small businesses will never succeed. And, and you could do that throughout any of those four kind of social determinants of health. That has been both a critical, critical uh, lens towards all of the legislation, really, that um, you know many of our colleagues have, have put to the floor. But it's also going to be and will continue to be a key focus for the Legislative Black Caucus. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more a little bit later about how we're still um, trying to, to approach that from a kind of, I'll call it legislative strategy perspective. Um, and we're really talking an awful lot right now about our investments in affordable housing. And it's it's kind of leveraging the conversation that's happening on, on education already. It's leveraging um, these sort of investments during and post pandemic that we're already seeing in, in healthcare. Uh, and I know that that investment in uh, affordable housing is, is both bipartisan and achievable. And when we do win, so again, it's not political, but when we do, 
um, those investments in our criminal justice system become so much uh, more attainable and achievable. So uh, I, I'm sure I've gone over whatever allotted time that uh, the leader has, has provided to us, but I, I'm loving this conversation. I'm loving the engagement that you guys are all providing again on a beautiful Friday night. Thank you, Rep. Nelson. And, and what Rep. Nelson is alluding to is some of our budget equity work and, and looking at systemic equity. And um, and I would say that during the pandemic, post-pandemic, there was all these conversations about inequities and systemic inequities. And you couldn't tell the, the Black caucus about these things. We knew about them. We had been living through them. Our grandparents had lived through them. So all of the sort of um, reports that were coming out during the pandemic because we it was definitely highlighted in this healthcare system that we have but we started to have more conversations about how those systemic inequities existed in housing and we can go back into the historic investments in housing in this country and how that was discriminatory for generations we can talk about transportation policy and how that policy generations ago right again divided and separated our communities from good jobs, good housing, good schools, right? By building highways right through our communities and cutting us off from those resources. We can talk about agriculture, and I talk about this often, right? The history of agriculture, in not just in this country, but specifically in this Commonwealth, being the number one industry in this Commonwealth, and how that whole industry was built off of, and I'm sure Rep. Rab can concur, stolen land and stolen labor and all kinds of other inherent um, disadvantages to other communities and advantages to, to others. And we have talked about this in our, in our caucus and then said, well, how do we move forward with legislation and investments, particularly through our budget, to correct some of those inequities over time? Um, one of the things that Black Caucus always tries to do is support our new members coming in, making sure that they can be effective so that they can go back into their districts and, and be effective in their districts, but also in the capital. Um, and that's important because, again, there's you know about 30 Black Caucus members, nine of which are Black women. And so there are not a, there is not a whole lot of people in this Commonwealth that share this experience that we have being in office, having to go to Harrisburg and legislate um, with the responsibility and privilege, but also burden of being the voice of, of other communities. Um, and so it's on, an honor to introduce our newest member, um, Rep. Gina Curry. Thank you so much, um, Rep. Chair Bullock. Um, I am so honored to be here this evening. I'm a little overdressed for the occasion because we have an event tonight in Delaware County. Um, but I'm going to be heading there soon. But when uh, Chair Bullock asked me to come on as the newest um, sworn in member, because I'm no longer the newest member, um, we have two more members coming in, um, some rep elects out in Allegheny County. And so we will be welcoming them into the Black Caucus very soon. So it's exciting to be here tonight um, in light of everything that Rep. Nelson has talked about. Um, it has been a flush of excitement for me coming in. I represent um, the 164th in Delaware County, um, Upper Darby, Lansdowne, East Lansdowne, Milbourne, and a part of Yaden. And in the new redistricting, will be coming away from Yaden, which is a little sad for me because I um, represented a Black population there that I'm very familiar with. Um, because my family is from nearby, um, my husband's family is from nearby Lansdowne. But I will be going over to Drexel Hill, which I'm very familiar with, as it's a part of the Upper Darby um, Township. So as a new uh, legislator, it is extremely, and I came in on a special election, which makes it even more um, uh, unique. Um, I came in in December, um, and, you know, I was a part of a freshman group, I believe, but really kind of like um, a freshman plus or a freshman minus, however you want to look at it. I'm not on any of the freshman pictures, but I'm a freshman. Um, and so getting used to everything um, was really a telltale. And we're still just a little over 100 days in office. And we are really, really moving we're all we're getting all ready for tomorrow. We have an open house. We're trying to let our community know 
because a lot of people who even come into the office, they don't know that there's a new rep. And so as a black woman in this community, I've served um, as an elected official um, for about three and a half years prior as a school board director. And knowing and fighting fiercely for equity has been my space. Um, fighting for representation in a district, school district where I was um, elected that looked different through socioeconomics, um, houses according to zip code. We know that there are more people of color, particularly on one side of the school district where I was representing. And um, there were some splits, still conversations today about you know, how representation goes forward in that school district, um, how people are have their home and school associations and don't really want to share um, the wealth across the entire district, and how there's a lot going on where there's still um, separation and not full inclusion um, where it comes to black and brown children and those zip codes. So I had quite a bit of experience early on as a parent, as a homeowner, and as serving in an elected position as a school board director with those pieces. Now I'm in a place where I am looking not only for my district and adding another school district that is majority black and brown, um, but I am looking to make decisions and write legislation that will impact the entire Commonwealth. So that's a unique space for someone who is coming in. And the Black Caucus has been um, a significant um, positive space for me in that because it's kind of like a brother and sisterhood that has come and welcomed me. Um, and whenever I have questions, everybody to believe, believe it or not, in the caucuses have been very welcoming, but there's something special about um, when folks know exactly what you're dealing with in your district um, and they can relate. And so those questions go out to many of my colleagues in the Black Caucus, like, what do you think about this? And, and how should I handle this? And they've been right there. And so um, as a fierce fighter, like I said, for equity, um, those spaces of education, housing, workforce development, and now even for me, um, looking at the maternity deserts right here in Delaware County as our um, healthcare systems are really in despair um, for serving black people, brown people, and um, having us not even be able to necessarily have babies in our own neighborhoods, but that we have to go out into other neighborhoods to have babies. And so these are all the things that um, I'm currently looking at and working on. And I'm so happy to be a part of the Legislative Black Caucus here in Pennsylvania, looking forward to growing as a Black legislator. And as a leader, I know um, Chair Bullock was talking about the leadership in the caucus, um, but I believe that we're all leaders in our space. Um, so there's nine uh, female leaders out in our spaces all across um, the areas that we represent. And throughout the Black Caucus, we're all leaders because we're Black leaders um, and um, leaders of color, because we do have other leaders of color um, that are in the, you know, that come to the caucus and participate. So this is a clear honor. And um, I am completely um, excited to be a part of this caucus and to have these conversations. And I'm going to try to hang on for another five minutes, but I have to go to another part of Delaware County to go to this event. So thank you, Chair Bullock, and to all of the um, my colleagues that are on the line, and to everyone who is watching tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Curry, for sharing your experiences. Um, and, and, you know, as our new newest or sworn in rep, but now you're almost a sophomore since two reps will be coming in after you. So, um, you know, we look forward to working with you. Uh, one of the other things about being a member of this nine, these, these I'm gonna call these divine nine, although I know that may be um, treading a little bit on some sorority language there, but I do think we are divine um, and we have been representing um, women and particularly black women in that space. And I know my, my colleagues, Rep Nelson and Rep Rabbi have to give me a little bit of liberty here to do this. Um, but one of those things is that we have to be able to say and speak 
from our hearts. And there's surely one who always reminds us, she's just going to tell it like it is. Um, and, and I love her for that because I remember when I first came to, to the house, there was another colleague, um, Black woman speaking on the house floor passionately about an issue that really, really was important to her and her district. And one of our white male colleagues leaned over to me and suggested that I shouldn't do that, that he liked me because I wasn't loud and I wasn't quote unquote passionate as my colleague was. Um, and, and that's not a compliment, right, um, at all. And so it, it was for me a turning point to say, okay, it's time to get loud. It's time to make sure my voice is heard um, and, and to be effective doing that. Um, and, and the longer I stay in, and do the work, I realized I needed to speak up more. I needed to make sure my voice was being heard because that's what the voters were sending me there to do. Um, and, you know, others don't, you know, bite their tongue necessarily. They say exactly what's on their mind. And I am so glad that I can do that with the support of my sisters who are in the house. And the one who shows me how to do it the most and sets the example is Rep Parker, because she is always going to tell you exactly how it is. And um, and I know her constituents vote for her just because of that. Uh, Rep Parker, please share with us some of the work you've been working on. <clears throat> um, good evening, Chairwoman Bullock. Good evening. And I'll, I will ditto to my colleagues on a Friday. You have me here. Um, to talk to you as passionate as I was doing some stuff in the district, but I can't, um, I would be remiss if I did not leave you with this quote. I am a strong black woman. I cannot be intimidated and I'm not going anywhere. And that is by Congresswoman Maxine Waters. And that is one of the things that I look at every single day when I'm one of the nine African-American women. Um, I am one of the ones that push back when chairwoman talked about Black History Month, I tell her I'm historic every day and I'm going to do Black History 365 days of the year. So don't give me some kind of month that people are using to commercialize and buy and do some pity type of things to um, tell me that they want to honor my heritage, honor my heritage by moving my bills along with my colleagues' bills out of committee that's been in committee for, oh, I ain't know we were supposed to do that, but I just wanted to let y'all know. That's how serious I am about this work. Um, and when you're talking about individuals on the other side of the aisle, I, I start off by saying, I'll know when you're serious about criminal justice. I'll know if you're serious about raising the minimum wage. I'll know you're serious about what our blackness truly is when they took over the roster before we got there, when we see more African-Americans on the other side of the aisles and only two staffers that they have. I'll know that you're serious when there's individuals that look like me that are in your seat. I'll know that you're serious when a bills that have been sitting for five, 10, 15, 20 years, then now they even have to change some of the numbers because they've been sitting there so long. That's why I get up every single day. That's why I'm always going to be passionate about what I'm doing. And just to show you why I'm passionate about the work, um, one of the bills that I have is um, a criminal, criminal record reform bill. And that's going to help current and potential employees by prohibiting the use of their past criminal records in certain situations. And that's what we have to do. Everybody, nobody on this Zoom tonight is innocent, but we don't need to condemn you for what you did when you were 16, 17, even 20. You need to have a fresh start and that would make you a viable part of this society. That means you would be contributing by giving your resources, your time, your job, your energy and your space. And that overall will put that money into the Commonwealth that will make everybody do better. So when you're talking to a person like Representative Parker, who represents a new part of the 198th district, which is looking a little bit differently, but I'm still gonna bring them the energy to let them know that they do have a fighter. They do have somebody who's gonna be passionate about African-American needs at every given time because there's not that many African-American women in the house, but I need them to know that we're gonna bring the house down if they don't pass our legislation that are constantly putting African-Americans behind the eight ball. We need to be in 
front of every single room. I'm tired of being on the menu. We need to make this stuff happen. And now I'm telling you within the pit of my belly, it's an urgency and the house is on fire. That's why I've made sure I've partnered with my colleagues, um, Chairwoman Bullock, as well with my colleagues, um, Morgan Cephas, to let them know how we feel about this um, enormous student loan debt. When we're talking about it, and I've been going back and forth about it, and I said, you know what, I'm going to go hard. I'm going to let them know. No, I don't want you to give me a pass. I want you to eliminate it now because that's more money that people need to be putting in their household budget. So you got to be careful when you get people like me who's passionate the mic. So I'll be quiet before Chairwoman Bullock turns off my mic. But I want to thank you. And I'm very excited to be here with all of you, especially on Friday. That's why I'm going to keep wearing my black. Listen, I could never and I would never, ever turn off your mic. Um, and unfortunately, that has been the experience for some of us. Rep. Rab and I sat on a state government committee where our mics were habitually turned off, um, where we have been threatened to be kicked out of the room if we continue to speak. Um, and so that has that is not actually uncommon for us to, for to happen to us. Um, and when we do speak about things in a committee that our the committee chairman does not want to hear and does not want to be heard. So um, I would never do that to you, Rep. Parker, but uh, we have seen that in committee hearings. We have seen that on the House floor um, when some of our colleagues' mics have been turned off um, as they were speaking about issues that mean something to them and to the constituents that they represent. Um, and that is the responsibility that we have as Black legislators um, and sometimes that burden to speak what no one wants to hear, right? To speak about things that have not been said on the House floor before, to speak truth, to speak truth sometimes, and to do it passionately and loudly when necessary. Um, and so sometimes we do slam the mic, drop the mic, turn the mic over, but we do those things because um, unfortunately sometimes we are ignored. And, 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 and I hate to say that, but we are ignored when we should not be because each and every one of us was elected to office just like anybody else in that room. And as Rep. Curry mentioned, we are all individual leaders. Um, and actually, you know, while someone may have a title as Speaker of the House or Chairman, we are all still represent the same number of people back in our district. And so at that in that way, we are still colleagues and peers, and we should be respected on that floor. And I would tell you that the Black Caucus has used its strength to do that. We have in the most recently during the pandemic to make sure our bills were heard on police reform, led by uh, former chairman Steve Kinsey and Summer Lee, our, our, our rebel rouser from the West, um, who really said it is time to do something different. And we took over the House floor rostrum to demand that our bills be heard on police reform. And one of those bills were introduced by Rep. Rab um, and, and others, but that is how we moved some of these bills forward. It was different for us to do at the at time, but it is an example of the power of the Black Caucus. And we have been sort of leveraging and using that power in other ways, uh, looking at amendments to bills, for example, I'm, I'm working on amendment for a police traffic data bill or amendment to the um, hands-free cell phone bill that a colleague is introducing. And we're saying, yes, we, we think we, we should have drivers driving safely. We don't want them to be distracted. But at the same time, we know that black and brown drivers are disproportionately pulled over, or even if they're not disproportionately pulled over, once that stop happens, what happens during that stop is different significantly different for black and brown motorists than it is for others. We're more likely to be searched, more likely to have the citation, more likely to have um, a violent encounter with uh, police officers. And so those things need to be monitored. And unfortunately, we do not have any requirement that our law enforcement keep any kind of record of who they're pulling over demographically, men, women, uh, people of color, people with immigration status, whether who's getting searched, who's not. And so in order to move that bill forward around distracted driving, they'll need to address traffic stops here in the Commonwealth. 
And so that's the kind of power and leveraging that we've been using with our block of votes. Um, but Rep. Rab, you were a part of that rostrum takeover um, two years ago. And unfortunately, I was at home trying to quarantine, um, but you risked it all to make sure <laughs> to make sure we pushed some po police reform forward. Tell me a little bit about that experience and some of the other work you've been doing within our caucus since you joined the House. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, it's an honor to be on this uh, esteemed panel. And thank you all, uh, Keystone Progress Summit. Uh, I think I've attended every year. Um, and uh, it's, it's great to be back, um, albeit virtually. Um, wow, that, that seems a lifetime ago. But the summer of 2020 was powerful because uh, there was a spirit amongst a number of us in office um, that we had to do more, that we had to break convention and allow the inspiration of tens of thousands of Pennsylvanians. And when I say that, I really mean Pennsylvanians, because also, you know, for those of us from Philly, we kind of say, you know, Philly folk, whatever. But here's the thing about that summer. There were documented protests around racial justice and police accountability in 66 of 67 counties. That means there were counties where there were no black folk. <laughs> there were no black folk, or maybe just one or two. And you had white folk organizing around racial justice. White folk. Now, I'm 52 years old. I've traveled the world. I have not been used to this level of agency and collaboration among white brothers and sisters before. I had a very, honestly, a very low expectation um, about would folks stand up even if black folk were not around. And what we've seen is there was pressure from white constituents to their Republican state representatives saying this is unacceptable and that's powerful. But there were people, young people, women, people of color who were on the front lines for weeks and that inspired a lot of us who were public servants in Harrisburg to act. And under the leadership of uh, Rep. Summer Lee, um, I was brought into a very small cadre of folks um, to plan a nonviolent protest on the House floor. And what we thought would take an entire day um, ended up only taking about 90 minutes. We rattled uh, the Republican leadership so much, they asked us to, to, to leave the rostrum um, and come down and negotiate. And within 36 days of that protest, we were able to enact four democratic bills into law, four. And here's why that's important. They were all around police accountability and they all come through the Judiciary Committee. Well, I serve on the Judiciary Committee. The Judiciary Committee is the most active standing committee um, on the House side. In fact, it is so active that you could probably put all of the activity of all the other committees combined and it might uh, equate with how much, uh, how many bills we, we run out of judiciary. So anything around the judiciary, sentencing, punishment, gun rights, um, uh, you name it, comes through judiciary. Well, we were able to get four bills enacted into law uh, one of them uh, uh, was a bill that I'd worked on for years, and this is not unique to me. Everyone can, who's been around for a while in Harrisburg, particularly if you have a D behind your name and you're Black, you got a lot of bills that never see the light of day. But we were able to be successful because we collaborated, we were bold, and we listened to the people, right? We, we weren't leading. We, in a sense, we were really following the will of the people saying, we demand justice now. And that's what it took to get things done. But here's the larger context. Either that day or the following day, the then Speaker of the House, Mike Terzai, said something that blew me away. And I don't know, uh, Rep. Bullock, if you remember what he said, but he said he wasn't even aware that there was slavery in Pennsylvania. And this was a man who had been in office for 20 years and was the Speaker of the House for six years. And he had the audacity to openly admit his willful ignorance about our history. Now you can say, well, what's the connection between slavery and what we did in the summer of 2020? And the short answer is everything, because there is no disconnect between the past, the present, and the future. And what we have uncovered over years is that 
if you look at state law over centuries in this state, there is a, a the through line of white supremacy in this state. I'm not talking about Texas. I'm not talking about Mississippi. We like to joke about um, the South. We like to joke, and I'm not one of these people who like to joke about rural folks in Pennsylvania. Well, I come from rural folk, and most Black folk do, too. Um, they are not the butt of any joke in my book. They are people who love their families and believe in, in, in a, a, a healthy, healthy, uh, equitable society who live in the country and who are on the front lines of social justice for generations. But here's the thing. There were people who got in the way of racial justice who were in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia for generations too. We had the opportunity to abolish slavery um, in 1780, but instead we made it gradual, which created a new kind of slavery in this state. What people forget is slavery was a state law. And even when we abolished it, we didn't really abolish it, but people still benefited from it. And all the laws that followed were doubling down on that racial violence. It is literally codified in state law, talking about Negroes not being allowed into municipalities, Negroes not being allowed to vote. And in fact, the all white male state legislature in 1838 said, no, you know, black, free black men have been allowed to vote kind of informally. It was nothing formal, but they've been allowed to vote. We're going to remove that. They came back and had a convention to strip free black men from voting in this state. And it took the feds in 1865, 1870, rather, to, uh, you know, have a, um, to pass a bill to allow for uh, the vote for everyone, for every man, anyway, for every man. Right. So why is that important? Because all the things we're fighting for now, and I know Keystone Progress understands this very well on progressive issues, the nexus for all the evil we're fighting today relates to all the complacency and willful ignorance and abject bigotry that we were fighting centuries ago. That is the connection. But most people don't know that context. So when Rep. Nelson is talking about a building black wealth, we have to understand that the guinea pigs for redlining were black Philadelphians. That was the national model based on federal policy um, to basically strip our ability to move into middle class, to have economic stability and have transgenerational wealth. That one thing that happened, or we could talk about the GI Bill. My grandfather was a, a, a proud veteran of World War II. When it was time for him to come home, he couldn't go to the same schools. He had to fight to get into the University of Maryland Law School. And when he was accepted and they found out he was black, they tried to bribe him and send him somewhere else. These are systemic issues. And we always talk about Congress. We talk about the White House, and that's important. But so many of these battles have to be fought in our state capitals. And we need people fighting the good fight every day. And when I talk about people fighting the good fight, I don't mean Democrats. I mean people who embrace justice because not all Democrats are created equal. I'm sure Chairwoman Bullock could have invited any number of Democrats who'd be like, yeah, I'm gonna pass on this panel. This makes me a little nervous. Just the use of the term equity is new for a lot of Democrats. Racial justice, that's, that sends shivers down some of our, our, our colleagues' spines. Even talking about white supremacy, and I'll be honest, and I'll end with this, the, the only reason I feel comfortable talking about white supremacy is because there were white people who validated that term in mainstream society. So I said, okay, now I don't have to be the angry black person because there's a reasonable white person in mainstream society who's saying it. So now I can say it and not be punished as much. Literally, a few years ago, as much as I believe that white supremacy is at the heart, at the root of all this evil, along with patriarchy and and global capitalism, et cetera, et cetera, me be embodying, me being a black man prevented me from comfortably saying what is so obvious to everyone now because of what category that put, put me in. 
And that I know that's even worse for black women because when black women say the same thing, you all are categorized, categorized in a far worse manner. So when we talk about um, allyship or being good accomplices in the, the, the fight for racial justice, it's important that we hear white people use the same language that we do because the privilege that comes with you saying it allows for a greater uh, acceptance of the issues that we all have to face together. So uh, we require everyone to be in this fight. And even though we may be um, in front of the camera and be on the house floor, um, everyone has a role. And um, I believe in this moment, having these types of forums and these discussions and being explicit around the problems and solutions is absolutely what we have to do is we have to prepare to lead. And when we are in the majority, and there's a there's a majority of enlightened public servants, um, we need to know how to lead. And we can't do that if we're too afraid to have difficult conversations that lead to the policies that will truly dissolve structural inequality. Representative Bullock, can I just say something about the comment that um, State Rab uh, talked about in terms of the 67 counties? Laura Putnam out of Pitt, um, did a study. And by July of that summer, there were 450 protests and 231 communities across the state. And a third of those were in red rural counties. And I, um, I just want to point that out because that is so significant. And I'm just floored by all of you because I want to do more to support the caucus and your work. I'll go on mute. I'm sorry. No, thank you, Carmina, for that. And I think, you know, first off, I want to thank Rep. Rab for his comments. And I always invite Rep. Rab because I know we're going to get the history lesson. Um, and he's going to put that perspective out there. He's our he's our uh, historian on, on deck. And so it's always important for me, I think, to have that context when we talk about the space that we are in and, and the foundation of this commonwealth the legislative body that we serve in and to understand you know the context in which we are introducing legislation and and the the reception that we feel right uh rep rab has been working diligently on an equity committee and having sessions about language and terminology and getting folks comfortable with saying words like equity getting comfortable with or not so comfortable or understanding the context of a word like a grandfather clause. Um, and so those kinds of things are important. And I don't think we would have had those conversations um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, definitely like not 30, 40 years ago, but as the Black Caucus members uh, become more influential within our, our legislative body, as folks understand that it's not just the 30 of us in the caucus, but every single person that participated in those rallies and those marches in all of those events in 2020, and, and, and that we also are backed by every other constituent within our district and folks all across this Commonwealth. We get calls from black and brown communities that are not represented by someone who may look or look like them or reflect their experiences or share their values. And so we, we respond to those calls and we say, yes, we're here to help you. How can we help you? We're, what are the issues in your community? Um, and whether that's a community like Johnstown or in Erie or somewhere else, we make sure we respond to them and we work with them. And, um, I, and there's just so much that we can talk about here. But the, real, the, the reality for us is that we have to go to Harrisburg in a space where there's not a whole lot of bipartisanship, where we are the one of the few, um, where it's assumed we're all from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, because that's the only place Black folk could possibly live, where our experiences are um, downplayed as just, well, that's just violence in Philadelphia and not wanting to address some of these root causes that folks talked about earlier in the chat. Um, and where our experiences are often belittled, um, but we have we have really changed the conversation, I would say, in, in recent years. And we have shown that our experiences, in many ways, is not much different than the experiences of almost you know, any, any, any Pennsylvanian in any corner of the Commonwealth. Um, and those experiences are shared experiences, whether you're the farmer somewhere in the middle of the T or you are the 
you know, warehouse worker in Pittsburgh. So those experiences have helped us shape the policy moving forward and have helped um, us use those experiences to to highlight the 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 black voices of Pennsylvania. Um, and we've been able to do that with with folks like Rep Nelson, who's been looking and focusing on budget equity and how we invest and has been looking at looking at social determinants of health and and wealth and education and housing. And then looking at someone, we've been able to do that work because of folks like Rep Parker, who's been focusing on cannabis and the cannabis industry and participation of black women and black uh, business owners in that space, making sure we have an equitable opportunity to participate in an industry that had actually been damaging to our communities for, for generations. Um, and looking at student loan debt, and working with Rep Cephas to push forward our maternal health and our dignity for incarcerated women packages and all of the other legislative initiatives for black women. We've been able to do that with the work of Rep Rad, who, you know, has <laughs> who's been daring at times. You know, I, I will always tell the story of how you stepped down and joined the sons and daughters of the American Revolution and, and shared with them as they were there about how you too are a son of the Federation of the American Revolution because of your family's history, he goes away, right, of a family's history, um, unfortunately, um, be, through slavery and, and, and the abuses of slavery and how you're, there you go, <laughs> you got the picture. So, um, and to move forward, you know, with folks like um, uh, Rep. Rep. Uh, uh, Curry, a new member from the from the suburbs, again working with education and addressing the issues. That we all have addressed issues around education, but so many of my other colleagues and the issues, whether it's environmental justice, the leadership of our our leader Rep. McClinton on the redistricting commission, but also looking at those who sit on state government committee in the. 30 plus bills that came in the, this year to restrict our voting power, to look at, mm, wait a minute, last year we watched in real time, we all sat as black votes were being counted in Philadelphia, in Detroit, and in, 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 and in Georgia and said, wait a minute, uh, um, black votes do matter. So maybe we need to change access and restrict assets again to, to how black voters um, participate in those communities. And it goes back to to that 1838 convention. I felt like we were watching it all over again, Rep. Rab, um, in the last year as we've seen our colleagues try to find ways to, to, dis, to disempower the voting population. Um, and whether we are talking about any of those issues, again, we are always looking at our voices as Black, black leaders and legislators, but the communities we serve as well. Um, I am internally grateful for my colleagues for being there. We talk all the time about our experiences. We share in each other's accomplishments and personal joys, but we are also there as a support when we go through the challenges. Because it's not easy to be in this space every day. It's not easy when um, you go to a building and, and not too many folks look like you um, and may give you certain stares. It's not easy to be in that building on Second Amendment Day at all. <laughs> and it's not easy to be um, away from your family, away from your community. Um, and, and some of us have had some personal um, challenges while we were elected. And to have the support of the Black Caucus um, during those times um, has been tremendously um, beneficial to me personally, and I believe to my colleagues as well. So. Carmina, Chair, we, I know we are wrapping up on time. Rep. Rab, go ahead. I, I just want to put this in there. I, I, I feel compelled to say this. Um, I, I've been uh, in office now for three terms and have, have worked with an, uh, a number of wonderful leaders. Um, your brand of leadership uh, at the helm. Second to none. Uh, of the Black Caucus has been... Um, a game changer. This is just my perspective. Uh, no shade on anyone else, but I, um, and not just because you're a true legislator and intellect, a public servant, but you also understand the emotional and psychological aspects of what it means to be a black legislator in the belly of the beast. And I'll never forget that moment 
when we were in the minority um, caucus room and you just really created the space in, in an impromptu fashion for us to check in as fellow human beings, as parents, as partners, as folks who are just trying to do the best we can. And that type of um, uh, holistic approach and uh, deeply human and humane leadership is rare. And I'll never forget that because at the end of the day, whatever you think about any one of us who's watching this, whether you think we're politicians, transactional, inspired, you know, conventional, we are human beings with flaws and foibles. Mm -hmm. And you acknowledged something that so few of us ever get a chance to say out loud. And you are the, the, the parent of, of two boys and so am I. We have similar uh, feelings and concerns and priorities. And I just want to thank you because too often we just talk about the policy. And at the end of the day, we're all just trying to do the best we can. And um, your leadership is reflective of that um, decency and compassion that I think makes us all better leaders and legislators. So thank you, Chairwoman. <laughs> Thank you, Rep. Rab. And I know we have to wrap up. No, I need to say this to you, Rab. Um, I mean, Representative Rab, excuse me. Um, I said those same sentiments. I want to thank all of you for being leaders for us. We recognize Keystone Progress recognizes your servanthood. And we I want to pledge today as a board member that we have to continue to enlighten Pennsylvanians that don't look like us about the work that you do. We need to enlighten them, Representative Parker, about the bills that have been there 15, 20 years. Rep. Nelson, we need to um, enlighten them about budget equity um, and what that looks like for all Pennsylvanians, but especially the ones that are marginalized. So I have to go do the moderating of the, of the candidates, the Senate candidates, but thank you. God bless you. Um, we're going to continue this. Um, I just am so indebted for you guys to take the time out tonight to do this because this is launching what needs to happen this year. Okay? So you have the support of us. You have the support of me. You have the support of all the Black women that I know um, that are going to lift you guys up and you Black men. And I'm very proud that um, Napoleon is part of the caucus as well. So I'm going to flip over Thank you. We're going to play this again on our website, Representative Chair. Um, and I just want this to be the continuation of more dialogue about the issues that you guys are leading for Black Pennsylvanians. You got it. Again? Thank you, Carmina. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.